Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to let you guys know, because of a shortage in time, you do not need to complete Section 2 or Section 4 in the Unit Number 11 Evolution Notes. Um, section 3 is the most important part of this chapter on evolution. It gives you a good idea of how the process of natural selection works. So I'd like you guys to just kind of focus on Section 3. Once you guys finish Section 3, please turn in the entire note packet by next Friday at 10 a.m. If it's not turned in by 10 a.m., I can no longer accept it. My grades are due on Friday next week. So that includes also any other missing work you guys may have for the entire fourth quarter. Okay, so Section 3 is all about Charles Darwin presenting his idea of natural selection. Okay, so if you guys remember, Charles Darwin was on the HMS Beagle traveling around the world. He collected a lot of uh, fossils and specimens and took a lot of notes about species diversity. And he came up with his idea of evolution. And he decided to kind of write it down when he got back to England. So Darwin was actually kind of stunned and disturbed by his own discoveries. Actually, after he wrote his manuscript, he was actually so afraid of it, he actually told his wife um, that when he died to publish it. He was afraid to publish it because of he was afraid of the backlash he might get um, because it kind of goes against some people's religious views. So he actually didn't publish his work as soon as he wrote it. Now, there was another scientist named Alfred Wallace who 25 years later sent Darwin a uh, ma his own manuscript because he was working in uh, Borneo uh, dealing with uh, the orangutans and a lot of the other organisms there. And... Uh, he had his own idea of evolutionary change. Now, when Darwin read his work, he realized, hey, this is the same ideas that I have and I wrote 25 years ago. So instead of waiting, Darwin wanted to get the credit. So he published his book as soon as he could and came out. It's called The On the Origin of Species in 1859. Now, most of you probably have never heard of this book, but I'm not joking when I say this is one of the most important books ever written. Not just science books, of all books of all time, it is one of the most important books. This is essentially the foundation of biology. So evolution is just the overarching concept in all of biology. And it wasn't until 1859 that someone had actually came out with a very comprehensive idea for how it worked. Okay, so most people thought it was extremely brilliant, especially the scientific community. Now, there were a lot of people in the everyday community who strongly opposed it because they felt that it went against their religious views. Now, in Darwin's book, he proposed a mechanism for evolution, which he called natural selection, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. And he presented a lot of evidence that evolution had been taking place for millions of years. At this time, a lot of people thought the Earth was only a couple thousand years old. And he's saying, no, evolution has been happening for millions and millions and millions of years, and it's continuing right now in all living things, including human beings. Now, he was actually kind of uh, afraid to talk about human and human evolution because he was afraid of the backlash. Okay, so how does his idea work? So Darwin noticed that within any species or any population, members are always different. So, like, look at the pumpkins in the picture below. No two pumpkins are exactly the same. Some of them are bigger than others. Some are different shapes. Some produce more seeds and so on. Some are different colors. Look around at different people in the world. Everyone's different. We all have different traits. Now, Darwin knew that some of this was due to heredity. Now, he didn't know how heredity worked because uh, Gregor Mendel, the pea plant guy, he had not came out with his work yet. His work actually didn't come out for like another 50 years or 40 years or so. So Darwin didn't understand how heredity worked, but he knew it was controlled by um, some factor that was being passed down from parents to offspring. Now, in Darwin's day, most people thought that variations were just minor defects, but he argued that these variations mattered. Darwin also noted that people had been changing plants and animals for thousands of years by breeding organisms or plants to have various traits. We would breed horses to be faster. We'd breed cows to produce the most milk. We'd breed dogs to have certain characteristics. If you look at that uh, crab at the bottom, you can kind of see a little face on the carapace of the crab. That's by no mistake. That's actually due to humans throwing back crabs that looked like they had faces on them. And over time, most of the crabs in the, this area, which is in Japan, started to have a face which kind of looked like a samurai warrior. There's a, there's a video uh, about this if you guys want to watch it too. 
So Darwin termed what people had been doing for thousands of years called artificial selection, which means man-made selection. For example, every dog species that is alive right now, every dog breed, I should say, they're all the same species. All of them came from a gray wolf about 20 or so thousand years ago. All dogs are the same species, but they've been bred to be different shapes, sizes, and have different characteristics. Now, artificial selection is the selection by humans by breeding for specific traits. For example, all those vegetables you see in the bottom, cauliflower, broccoli, etc., they all came from a single plant, which humans started breeding the plants for sp specific parts of the plant, which gave rise to all those different vegetables. Now, Darwin noted, or Darwin realized, if humans can ch cause changes in organisms, why can't nature? So he based this as, his, this is the basis of his idea, which is called natural selection. Okay, so Darwin realized that um, all organisms have to compete for resources. He realized that most organisms produce way more organisms, babies, offspring you should say, than can possibly survive in the environment. So these, these organisms have to compete with each other for survival, compete for resources. So this struggle for existence means that organisms of the same species have to compete with each other for food, living space, mates, and other necessities of life. This was key to his idea of evolution. Now, in the struggle, the predators that are the fastest or the better hunters or have longer claws or longer teeth are the most likely to catch their prey. Therefore, they're the most likely to get food, which makes them the most likely to survive. And then the key, the most likely to reproduce. It's all about reproducing. Okay, so the ones that reproduce the most successfully get to pass on their genes to the next generation the most often and control the next generation's traits. Okay, on the opposite side of the coin, prey that are the fastest, the most camouflaged, the most protected, are the most likely to survive and therefore reproduce. Okay, so it's kind of a game of cat and mouse between the predators and the prey. The ones that have the best characteristics are the most likely to survive and reproduce. Okay, so... Darwin called the ability of an organism to survive and reproduce in its specific environment its fitness. I know you guys have all heard the saying, survival of the fitness. It's based on the organism's adaptations, its ability to survive in its own environment. Okay, so an adaptation is any inherited characteristic that increases the organism's survival or chance of survival. For example, the Arctic fox in the bottom right, there's, it's not a coincidence it has um, white fur, that allows it to camouflage in with its environment. Okay, so adaptations can be anatomical, they can be structural, like porcupine's quills, they can be physiological, like chemical processes inside of the organism's body, or they could be behaviors like pack hunting. So there's a lot of different types of adaptations, but anything that increases the organism's chance of survival, we call an adaptation. Okay, so successful adaptations enable the organism's to be better suited to their environment, and again, better chance to survive and reproduce. Okay, so individuals with characteristics that are not as well suited to the environment tend to either die or just leave fewer offspring so they their genes don't get passed on as often. Okay, so this is why this was called survival of the process, survival of the fittest. In fact, Darwin didn't actually call this survival of the fittest. Another uh, scientist came up with that specific terminology but once he did, Darwin kind of adopted it and ran with it. So essentially, being the fittest does not mean the fastest, the strongest, the most camouflaged, whatever. It really just means the best at reproducing, the best at passing their genes on to the next generation. Okay, now, evolution is driven by mutations. We already talked about mutations, a change in the genetic material, which changes the amino acids and the protein, which can add different characteristics to the organism. Okay, so many mutations are, most mutations are just harmless, but some can be harmful and some can be helpful. A favorable, favorable mutation can increase the organism's chance of survival and allow them to pass on that gene to the next generation. Okay, now unfavorable mutations tend to disappear kind of quickly because they're less likely to pass on because those organisms are less fit in their environment. Like the albino characteristic for this peacock sticks out like a sore thumb and predators are easy to um, identify them and eat them. Okay, so because of its similarities to artificial selection, Darwin termed his idea natural selection. 
Okay, so natural selection, the traits that are being selected are being selected by the environment and it contributes to the organism's fitness in its own environment. Now, over time, natural selection slowly causes changes in the inherited characteristics of a population. These changes slowly increase a species as a whole, not just an individual, a species fitness in its environment. Now, natural selection cannot be seen directly. You as an individual are not evolving right now. It can only be seen over successive generations. Many, many generations over time, you can see the changes. Okay, this is important. Individual organisms do not evolve. The population as a whole does. Okay. Now, natural selection produces organisms that have different structures, they can establish different niches, different, in, different parts of the environment, different um, food sources, or it can cause them to occupy different habitats. And this is how the finches on the Galapagos Islands slowly diverge to become different species. Now, every species has descended with change from other species over time. This is the tree of life idea. Every living organism on this earth is related to every other organism on the earth. Darwin called this descent with modification. So it's a really kind of a overarching idea that everything is related to everything else. So descent with modification implies that all living organisms are related to one another. All life on earth originally originated from one common ancestor. Now, what was that common ancestor? We don't know because there's, there's no evidence of it in the past. It was over three and a half billion years ago, but it was something similar to a common everyday bacteria. And we call this idea common descent. Okay, now, just last thing, I just want to get this out there. You did not evolve from a chimpanzee. So you and your cousin are related because you share a common ancestor, who is your grandparents. You did not evolve from your cousin. Many students think that humans evolved from chimpanzees or gorillas or apes. But that's not true. That we are related to them because we share a common ancestor. They're essentially like our cousins. We did not evolve from chimpanzees. We both evolved from some common ancestor about six million years ago. So humans did not evolve from chimpanzee. Here is a tree of life which shows kind of different organisms that we are related to. If you see on the top right, you'll see Homo sapiens, which is us, and the top left, you'll see chimpanzees. If you scroll back about five and a half, five million years ago, you will see a branching. That is where we last shared a common ancestor. We did not evolve from chimpanzees, but we are related to them. We're like cousins. Um, we are also related to Neanderthals, which you guys have all heard of. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are different species. We both came from Africa, but Neanderthals are no longer alive. There's actually a lot of evidence that shows that we did interbreed with them, and most people, if not all people on this earth, have some Neanderthal DNA in them.